Matthew Hebebrand, I'm one of the chaplains here at, at Common Ground. I am so uh, happy and glad that uh, you could join us today uh, and be part of our family, whether you're here uh, in person or, uh, or out there online or going to watch this later on in the week. Uh, we we uh, are happy to, to have you here. Um, we have some new, new Common Ground, I guess, swag for the lack of a better word. Uh, we're going to give out some of these, these mugs to our newcomers as they come in. It says, uh, Equipping the Saints for the Work of the Ministry. That's out of Ephesians. Uh, and on the back side, it says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Uh, that's kind of our, probably, hopefully, our, our theme for the next uh, little while, is just equipping the saints for the ministry. And you are an important part of that, whether you're here for the first time or that you've been here uh, for, for a while. God has given you gifts uh, to, to encourage one another uh, so that the fullness of Christ may, may come to pass, the full knowledge of God in that, that we've been talking about in Ephesians. Uh, and you're a big part of that. If you're here for the first time, we just have the gift. I'm not going to have you stand up and say your name. Uh, terrifies some people. Um, we'd love to, to get to know you. This is just a gift for thank you for being part of our family today. Uh, and if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, let us know. Anything that we can try to plug you in, whether it's here at Common Ground, uh, we have lots of other religious services that are happening across the inst installation that are fantastic, uh, that, that they want to worship Jesus as well. So maybe this is not the best fit for you. We'd love to just point you in the right direction. Or if it is, we'd love to plug you in somewhere. God has given you a gift, and we'd love for you to use it here at, at Common Ground. Is anybody here that would like, we got some gifts, anybody? Except we got a, a new in the middle right there. Awesome. Welcome. And if, and if you're, you don't want to raise your hand yet and you really want one of those gifts, you just come and talk to one of our ushers at the end. We'd love to just to meet you and say, and say hello. A couple other announcements that we got coming up. Uh, next Sunday is, is Palm Sunday, uh, so it'll be the first Sunday of the month. We will have communion during that time. Uh, and then that begins Holy Week. And so there are several uh, of worship opportunities throughout that whole week uh, that, that you can, can participate in. Uh, on Thursday, we have a, a Monday. I know it's on Thursday, but it's not Monday service. It's a Monday service. Um, and that comes from uh, when Jesus washed uh, the disciples' feet on, the, on that Thursday uh, for the Last Supper. And uh, so there's a Greek word uh, on Monday. It's about service and about um, kindness and, and serving one another, ultimately. Uh, we're going to join forces uh, with uh, Christ the King over at PVC, so we're going to be helping them do the Monday service. And then on Friday is a Good Friday service that's at 1800 at PVC again on Good Friday. Uh, you come out and join uh, their Tenebrae service they have on Friday over at uh, Pacific Victor's Chapel. And then on Sunday morning uh, at 0630 at the Four Memorials Chapel, 4 CMC at 0630 is the Easter sunrise service. And we'd love to have you guys come out and see for that. And then we have our regular service time here at 11. Uh, we do have like a little bit bigger special music on Easter Sunday. Uh, we'll have a, a, an Easter uh, cantata type thing uh, that'll run for about 20 minutes in that service, uh, along with some of our other regu regular hymns. And then uh, we'll be preaching the, the Easter resurrection message. Um, next week on, so on Palm Sunday, we will finish our, our study in Ephesians. So we are getting towards the end of that. And then in a couple weeks after Easter, we'll begin our, our new study in Isaiah. So if you are want to get caught up, uh, start reading a couple of the first few chapters in Isaiah, uh, because that's, that's the direction um, that we are headed. I think that's all my final announcements. So I hope to see you all at these, these awesome, awesome events uh, during Easter Holy Week. Uh, what a great time to worship the, the risen Jesus Christ and do that together and corporately, because a lot of these events are, are going to be joined in with other uh, Protestant groups around uh, Camp Humphrey. So it's great to see other uh, brothers and sisters uh, from other services, and this is a great time to do that. Without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Chaplain Kwok to continue. Good morning, Common Ground. Yeah, worship, uh, call to worship comes from uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 and Psalm 107, verse 1. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. 
Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to stand before your presence this morning. Please receive our worship and bless us so we can live our life for your kingdom and your holy name. Wherever we are and whatever we do, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. If you could please stand with me and sing hymn 688, Savior like a shepherd lead us. A shepherd need us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy faults prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us thine, we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear or hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear or hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful thou we be. Mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to thee. See thy favor, early let us do thy will. Blessed Lord and Holy Savior, with thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Love us, love us still. Now please turn with me to 588, All for Jesus. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. Some pause all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my hours. Let my hands perform his bidding, let my feet run on his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only, let my lips seek forth his grace. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, let my lips speak forth his praise. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, let my lips speak forth his praise. Since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, 
I've lost sight of all he sighed. So enchained my spirit's vision, looking at the crucified. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, looking at the crucified. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, looking at the crucified. Oh, what wonders, how amazing, Jesus, glorious King of kings. Call me his beloved, let me rest beneath his wings. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, resting now beneath his wing. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, resting now beneath his Please be seated. At this time, let us give our tithe offering to God as we sing, I surrender all. doxology.
before uh, back to your uh, place, would you just greet one another, person next to you, at least three people around you, would you do that please? This time, let us take a few moments to communicate with the Almighty God and loving, caring, our God the Father through silent prayer. Why don't we confess all our sins, also whatever you are facing and going through? Simply tell them, such as concerns and stress and any pain you might have, let us pray. Father, we are standing before your presence, not as perfect children, but as children, those who need your grace and love. Would you please forgive our sins, purify us with your blood of Jesus Christ. We need your divine healing and help physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Lord, be with our unit and family here in Korea and back in the States. Give them strength and wisdom. We solely depend on your guidance and protection in every moment, in every step of our life. Now, Lord, help us open our hearts and minds to listen to your words this morning. We ask the Holy Spirit to be with the Chaplain Leva as it preaches your word. We invite your Holy Spirit and ask you to transform our hearts and life. We pray these things in the way Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the, the, our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Um, are youth dismissed at this time? No? No? Okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, the um, scripture reading from this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 17, and that can be found on page 950 of your Pew Bible. Uh, please stand if you are able for the reading of the word. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 17. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Choir for that beautiful sun, and thank you, sir, for coming this here today. It means a lot to me. Uh, well, this morning's scripture is familiar to many of us. Let me turn this on first. Can you hear me now? Is it on? All right. He, they said that it's on. Okay, this morning's scripture is familiar to many of us. It's uh, the armor of God, right? We all had this Sunday school class on the armor of God. It's an illustration provided by the Apostle Paul based on the armor that the Roman soldiers wore. Um, it is meant to remind us that we are to be ready and equipped to engage in a spiritual battle through spiritual means. Now, before we start, I remember when I was a young soldier back in the few years before the Iraq war, and we did not wear body armor back then. In fact, through basic training, AIT and three years of uh, active duty, never once did I wear body armor. Now, for, so, for some of us, of us who remember the war, the early years of the war, uh, you can probably recall the news media reporting that family members were purchasing body armor for soldiers that were going on deployment. Articles saying that the army did not have, no, have enough body armor. It was like a huge scandal. I remember those days. And it took about years or so to fix that problem. You see, suddenly, body armor became a need and important item because we were now a nation at war. In the same way, I feel like sometimes when it comes to the armor of God, many Christians do not see the need and importance of the armor of God because you're not aware that we are a people at war. Let me remind you of the previous verse before we, the one we read today in Ephesians 6, 12. And I like how the NLT says it. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The people of God are a people at war in a spiritual warfare. Paul is saying, if you can recognize this, then I need to tell you how to fight this war. The fact is that many of our brothers and sisters are wondering, why, why am I having so many troubles? Why am I going through so many things in my life? Why do I feel like I'm in, under constant attack? Well, may I suggest that perhaps it's because you're not wearing your armor. You're in the middle of the battlefield. Maybe it's be, may I be so bold to suggest that you might not be wearing your armor because you don't realize that you are at war. So I'm going to break the news for you today. Yes, you are in a spiritual war. And today we're going to learn practical ways to be protected with the armor of God. So let me make these things clear before I continue on. There's a distinction between a war and a battle. The war in Iraq and Afghanistan landed, uh, lasted for 20 years, but we didn't battle every day. There were battles in between that, right? In the midst of that. Just like in your life, you are in a war, you prepare for that war, because there will be battles, but not every day will be a battle. Right? Paul says in verse 13, Therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you are able to resist the enemy in the times of evil. Then after the battle is done, you will be standing firm. Then he goes to say, stand firm, or stand your ground. The first, the first thing that Paul is telling us to stand firm, so before he even begins to discuss the armor of God, 
he wants you to have a mindset of readiness. He's visualizing that the, the Roman soldiers, the legions, as they in formation, is standing firm with their shield and sword, waiting for the enemy. What Paul is saying, you cannot be complacent, you cannot be passive in this battle, in this war. You have to be alert, ready, and able to fend off the enemy's attack. When you neglect your relationship with God, you allow the enemy to have the element of surprise on you. You allow the enemy to get the upper hand on you and your family. I tell you again, you cannot stand against the enemy if you're not ready and well equipped. So when, with this mindset of standing firm or standing your ground, he tells us to put on the belt of truth. And the belt of truth is like the foundational piece in the armor of God. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain in a second here. Truth is defined as the objective standard by which reality is measured. The Bible defines that in John 17, 17, it says, Make them holy by your truth. Teach them, teach them your word, which is the truth. See, when we're talking about truth, it's objective truth. It's not based on what you feel. It's not based on what you think or your teachers think. It's God's truth revealed to us in his word. Now, I know we live in a culture where everyone believes that they have their own truth, right? We talk about speak your own truth. And by extension, they create their own reality and expect everybody to accept that reality. It's like a multiple reality. It's like the Bible world. We have a multiple reality going on around here. And then they find themselves confused, lost, unfulfilled, and without joy. Because there's only one truth that has been given unto us. And since the devil is a liar, you better put on the truth to be ready for battle. So how do we put on the belt? I submit to you that it's by daily reading of God's word. This is the foundational one because many of the other elements of God's armor will depend on your reading of God's word. Paul goes on to say, put on the righteousness like a breastplate. So what is righteousness then? Well, righteousness can be defined as the standard of God requires for people to be acceptable to him. In essence, righteousness is the application of that truth that you're reading by putting on the belt. You're applying that. As you're reading God's word, you're discovering his standards, and you apply that to your life. In essence, righteousness is the opposite of sinfulness, of immorality. Now let me consider for a second a breastplate. A breastplate is designed to, to guard your chest area, right? More specifically, your vital organs. More importantly, your heart. So he's asking us to protect our heart with righteousness. And when the Bible speaks of the heart, it is described as the essence of who you are. It is the center of morality, the will, and your desires. Let me give you a few examples so you can kind of get the idea. Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand? Now, if you go to the New Testament, it says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. As you can see, out of the heart flow your actions, your behaviors. Now, fortunately, I'm not going to leave you there. The Bible also tells us that we can get our hearts changed. We can get a heart transplant. Ezekiel 18, 31 says, Cast away from you all transgression that you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. So now you're going to ask me, how can we change our hearts? I'm glad you asked that. How can I go from a sinful heart to a, heart, a righteous heart? Well, I'm going to take you to Psalms 119. He said, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. In other words, we have to hide, memorize God's word in our heart. And that's why it is important that you put on the belt of truth first, because if you're not reading God's word, you can't memorize God's word. And if you're not memorizing God's word, you cannot hide it in the core of who you are. And you remain unprotected. So put on the breastplate of righteousness by memorizing God's truth. 
Now we come to the place where Paul is asking us to put the shoes of the gospel of, fee, of peace. Now continuing with this theme of a, of a Roman soldier, historically the, the footwear of a Roman soldier has spikes in the bottom of their foot. And it was for them to have some stability in combat. Paul calls us to wear the shoes of the gospel of peace so that when the enemy comes against you, you remain stable because of the peace that the gospel has provided you. Now, anyone that understands the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. I know this is a Greek, but it's a Hebraic people. The understanding of this word of peace or shalom is a well-being. It's a total well-being, a hope that God gives you, which allows you to remain stable. The Bible defines it as calm and tranquility of soul despite external turmoils. Calm and tranquility of soul despite external turmoil. All right, let's be practical. How do I put on the shoes of the gospel of peace? Let me take you to Philippians 4.4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And you go to verse 7 and say, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So, peace comes as a result of rejoicing. Okay. So how do I express my rejoicing? Glad you asked. Guys, I home with, with me all the way. That's good. Let me take you to Psalms 95. We're going to do a lot of jumping around. 95, 1 to 2. And it says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. All right, let me put it together for you. The scripture tells us to worship is an expression of rejoicing, which in turn invites God's peace into your life. So what if I'm not joyful? Just not feeling it today. I'm going to respond with that with a story from the Bible. Story time, guys. In Acts 16, we're told that Paul and Silas were stripped naked of their clothing, beaten with rods, thrown into prison with their hands shackled and their feet in stocks. And the Bible records their response to their situation. In Acts 16, 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. If you know the rest of the story, the earthquake came, and they were free in no time. You see, when the enemy attacked them, not only spiritually, but physically, as they said, they're bleeding, swollen, and bruised, they overcame because they, have, they were wearing the shoes of the gospel of peace. They may have stripped them of their clothes, but they could not strip them of the armor of God. So what am I saying to you? As you get dressed this morning, as you drive to work, whenever an opportunity rises, put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Get your praise on, is what I'm saying. Every day, an opportunity for worship. Because rejoicing has nothing to do with what's going on around you. It has a lot to do with the spirit of God that lives within you. And the peace that God allows in your midst. I'm going to give you a little extra. Without taking away this, all of your spiritual benefits of worship, you know, I want to give you a little extra for those science minds out there. A scientific study done in 2015, and it was published in the Frontiers in Psychology Journal, it says, confirmed that singing reduces the amount of cortisol in the body. Now, cortisol is the stress hormone that's connected with fear, stress, and anxiety. In the same study, it's revealed that singing releases endorphins, happy hormones. We got the happiest people in the world here in the choir. And it even stimulates your immune system. Your immune system. They're going to live a long time. Now, it seems to me that God was pretty smart when he called us to worship. In all circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now I want to address putting on the helmet of salvation. A helmet protects the head. We know that, right? But I want you to know that Paul is talking to people who are already saved. So he's not saying put on salvation. Okay? He's not talking about getting saved. He's talking about protecting your mind with the recognition of where you stand as one who has been saved by Christ. Because see, the enemy, the devil, wants to destroy your assurance with doubt 
with discouragement. So the best way to put on the helmet of God is to come against those doubt and discouragement with gratitude. It is a battlefield in the mind. How do we do that, you say? Let's go to Philippians 4, 8. He said, finally, brother, whatever is true, you'll know this verse, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. In other words, to put on the helmet of salvation is to express gratitude. I have plenty of reasons to be grateful for. Because let's not forget that your salvation was provided by grace through faith, independent of anything that you could have possibly done. It was given to you freely, unearned. And with it, we get the right to be called children of God, according to John 1.12, right? And if we are children of God, it reminds me in Philippians 4.19 that God will supply every need of you according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I have plenty to be thankful for. How many of you can testify of God's goodness in your, bli- in your life, of God's blessings in your life? If you want to put on the helmet of, of God, of salvation, do it by daily expressing gratitude. Share with your family all the good things that God has done for you. Write it in your personal journal so you don't forget because we, don't, we have a short-term memory. Write it down in your journal so you don't forget. Share it with your friends and neighbors because a testimony brings hope and encouragement. Now it comes to one of my favorites, it's the sword of the spirit. Up to this point, we discussed nothing but defensive elements of the armor of God. The sword of the, 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 this is the only one that's an offensive piece. It's the sword of the spirit, and Paul identifies that as the word of God. Now some denominations, and since we're a multi-denominational church, I'm going to bring that up. Identify the sword of the Spirit also, according to the next verse in verse 18, as praying in the Spirit. Now, you've got to excuse me for a second because I'm about to get really nerdy on you, okay? We're going to go to the Greek. I'm sorry. I have to. There are three nouns in Greek for the Word, for the word of God. you got the graphe, which is the written Word of God. We have the logos, which is identified in John 1 as the living word of God, which we know is Jesus. And then we have the rema, which is the spoken word of God. In this verse, Paul is referring to the rema, a spoken word of God. This use of the word of God should remind you of the time when Jesus was being tempted in the desert and how he responded to Jesus was, it is written. It is written. Now, please know that you cannot speak the Word of God if you don't memorize the Word of God. You cannot memorize the Word of God if you don't read the Word of God. All of these function together. The all elements are important, and they have to be worn daily. The power of God goes beyond the written pages. The power of of the Word of God when delivered by faith, is one of the strongest weapons against the enemy. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We need to learn properly handle the Word of God. Know how to will the Word of God. Praying in the Spirit and the using of God's Word, it is the most effective weapon against Satan. Church, it worked for Jesus, it'll work for you. Now when we come into the final piece of the armor of God, and some of you are like, oh, that's awesome. For those who have a keen eye, you probably noticed that I skipped it. I did that on purpose. And I brought it to the end for a reason. I'm going to tell you why in a second. Paul says, take up the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Okay? The shield of faith is to be used when you are under attack. 
when you're in the midst of it, when the enemy is starting to, be, to begin their offensive against you. Now, for me to be able to explain in a practical way how to pick up the shield of faith, I'm going to read a story from Second Chronicles chapter 20. If anyone here remembers King Jehoshaphat, he's one of the good kings. So I'm going to summarize the story today, but I do encourage you to go home and, and read the story because it's, it's, it's worth reading. It came to pass that the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Midianites they came against Jehoshaphat in battle. Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed that there should be a fast throughout the Judah. During this fast, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehoshaphat, one of the Levites, and he said, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde. Battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. So they rose up early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. Jehoshaphat stood up and said, Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Then he appointed, this is interesting, he appointed some to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and said, this is key, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love and forever. I want you to pick up on something real quick. They are thanking God when the battle has yet to be won. They are thanking God for the victory that they have yet to see, that they have yet to come. They don't know how it's going to happen, but they know God, and they know that His love endures forever. It's unfailing. They don't know how, but he will overcome their enemies. And their faith paid off. Let me tell you the rest of the story. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. And they all helped to destroy one another. Before they got to the battlefield, the enemy was already destroyed. God caused them to destroy each other. Again, they didn't know how it was going to happen. But it happened. So when Jehoshaphat and his people came to the, take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers good clothing and precious things which they took for themselves and they cannot carry anymore. They were three days in taking spoils. It was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. A perfect example of using the shield of faith is choosing to give God thanks when the fiery, the flaming arrows of the enemies are coming at you. You don't see the victory. You don't know how am I going to get out of this. But God knows. And I'm going to thank you, God. Philippians 4, 6 reminds us, do not be anxious about what? Anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, I hope you picked up on that. Let your request be made known to God. Because hear what Paul is saying. Don't be anxious and worry. Got it. Easy. Well, sometimes it's easier said than done. But come to God first with your request and with your gratitude for granting your request. Notice that he didn't say, come to him with prayer and supplication, and then once you get your answer, then go ahead and ask some thanksgiving in there. That's not what he said. He said, come with your thanksgiving right away. God wants to hear your requests, your supplications, your needs. But come with your thanksgiving again. Because if you are a child of God, he's got your answer. And this is why I left the shield of faith class. Because before you pick up that shield, you better be wearing that armor already. Okay? And, before, and since you have that armor already, you have to be already wielding that, that sword. It's like the Romans day, right? Stab and shield. Pray and shield. Supplications and shield. Request and shield. Right? I need you, God. Thank you, Lord. I don't get it, God, but I need you. Thank you, Lord. The victory is yours. Church, I, I don't know what you're facing today. Uh, you know, whether it be a, uh, your relationships on the attack, whether it be your finances being on the attack, your health, might be under attack. 
whatever that might be that you've been praying for some time now, and you just don't see the victory in your life. Begin to thank God. Begin to thank God. Because he promised that he would provide for all, not all of our needs, according to his riches and glory. Don't forget, don't ever forget that you are the child of God. I don't care where you grew up. I don't care what your parents were. I don't, don't, it doesn't matter. Today, you are a child of God. The most high God. I don't have to see my victory. I just need to know and believe in the victor. So to pick up the shield of faith is to declare, thank you, Lord, for the victory that is yet to come. To God be the glory, for you have rescued me in the time of need. All right. Let me give you a conclusion today. Let's recap. Putting the helmet is to express daily gratitude for our salvation and for all the blessings that come with that salvation. To put on the belt is to read God's word daily. The breastplate is to memorize that word and hide it in your heart so that you may not sin against him. To put on your shoes is to bring peace into your life through worship. To wield that sword is to declare God's words against temptation from the enemy and to pray in the spirit making requests known to God. And finally, to wield our shield is to thank God for the victory that is yet to come. So, if you don't have, I don't want you to live here this morning unchanged. Amen? That's my second amen. I challenge you to make this a daily activity, an everyday activity. You don't get to wear your armor sometimes. Some of our soldiers are wearing Iraq and Afghanistan. We, you know, when we're outside the wire, we, we got to wear, we don't go in PTs. We were wearing our body armor. Because we were ready. There was an existential threat. If you don't have time to read, then listen to an audio Bible. Do whatever it takes to ensure that you're properly equipped every day because you don't know when the next battle's coming. Practice it in your life and teach your children to do the same. And may God continue to empower you as you go from victory to victory. Amen. Church, please stand and sing with me hymn 603, Jesus, I my cross have taken. and on from grace to glory. 
remain standing. Receive the benediction. Heavenly Father, I just come before and I pray that you will bless each and every family here today. May they learn to put on the armor of God every day. May they go out into the world prepared and ready for whatever the enemy may throw at them. Guard their heart, Lord God, I pray. Build them up strengthen them throughout this week and the days to come build up a nation of warriors for god in this spiritual warfare we ask this in your name your son jesus christ amen son.